The superhero version of the legendary steel driving man, but with the technical savvy of a certain playboy billionaire philanthropist at Marvel, Iron Man and War Machine was already a thing. What else is a man of steel going to call himself if Superman is already taken too? You can't see me, you Stevie, wondering how I reach more evolutions than Eevee and make it look easy. What is up Earth's Mightiest Subscribers, it's Blur Without Fear, welcome back to the channel. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about John Henry Irons, aka Steel. John Henry Irons, in both DC Comics New Earth and Prime Earth continuity, was named after the actual American folk hero, John Henry, the steel driving man. John Henry Irons originally first appeared in The Adventures of Superman number 500 in 1993 by Jerry Ordway and Tom Grummet. John was galvanized to step up as a hero in the wake of the finale of the death of Superman, where the Man of Steel was killed in his fight against Doomsday. But John Henry Irons wasn't an alien from Krypton like Superman. He was just a normal guy, but he was a talented scientist and considered a genius in the field of electrical and mechanical engineering. Having grown up an orphan due to his parents being murdered when he was still a child, he didn't have the same luxuries that Bruce Wayne did, and his being orphaned played a huge role in his upbringing and forming him into the man that would eventually become, quite literally, the new Man of Steel. He knew he didn't have the money to go to the best schools or colleges, so he worked hard to earn a sports scholarship to Yale University, graduating with honors and eventually becoming one of the most influential minds in the world of high-tech weapons and warfare, gaining employment at Ameritech, one of the biggest weapons manufacturers in DC Comics. But eventually, John realized even with all the money in the world, it doesn't mean anything if his weapons were being used to hurt innocent people and that his creations were falling into the hands of gangs and terrorists. This led to him destroying all the prototypes he'd created and quitting Ameritech, choosing to live a more meager life as a steelworker instead. This is actually what put him in the path of Superman. When a co-worker of John's fell from a high-rise building that they were working on, John risked his own life to save that man. This led to him being saved by Superman, with Supes telling a still shaken John Henry that if he wanted to make it up to him to ensure he made his life count for something. And he did. He became the new Man of Steel during the reign of the Superman. Everything I just mentioned was the New Earth version of Steel's origin prior to the New 52. This is something I say a lot of times when I do stuff like this because DC Comics has a very weird and interesting history. For those unfamiliar, New Earth continuity is generally considered to be anything that happens in DC Comics after the 1985 event Crisis on Infinite Earths and before the 2011 launch of the New 52. And just like any other DC Comics characters created before 2011, Steel is one of the many characters who tends to have two different origin stories. The New 52 led to a slightly revised version of Steel under what is now considered Prime Earth continuity. Here, his story began with John not just being an ordinary person, but being the grand nephew of a 1950s crime fighter named John Henry Jr., a black superhero who wielded a massive sledgehammer forged by the original American folk hero, John Henry. And this weapon granted him superhuman strength and the ability to unleash shockwaves when striking the ground with the hammer. Beyond that, the rest of his origin is largely unchanged, and this change is actually fairly recent since it happened this year in DC's The Golden Age number one. Originally, Steel used his power armor to achieve his Superman status, with each of his various suits he's used being developed by himself. His first power armor granted him superhuman strength that was impressive, though nowhere near on Superman's level. Even without the armor, his strength is likely on par with an Olympic-level power lifter. He's been depicted holding up part of a collapsing building prior to gaining the power armor, and even survived that same building falling on top of him 
with little to no serious or visible injury. With the armor, he is even more durable, able to resist impacts like falls from a great height, high caliber ballistics, though the higher the caliber, the less effective the armor is against it. It can also protect him from extreme temperatures, strikes from superpowered attackers, and most forms of energy attacks, even psionic. The second armor he created was even more durable and was able to allow him to survive in the vacuum of space, as well as having a built-in life support system that provided not only air, but also water and energy in the form of adrenaline. And while his first armor allowed Steel the ability to fly thanks to it being outfitted with jets on his boots capable of propelling him as fast as the speed of sound, which is roughly 700 plus miles per hour, he would later add a teleportation system to the second armor that allowed him to travel instantaneously where he needed to be. His second armor was also advanced enough to equal Superman's own vision and hearing, as well as Superman's ability to perceive the electromagnetic spectrum. He also added a scanning array that lets him analyze opponents, structures, materials, and his environment to not only help him with the targeting of opponent's weak points, but also to investigate unknown elements and materials and track down his targets. It can even manage his weapons, ensuring his power consumption is optimal, and he has gyro sensors on board to help with balancing. He's also managed to outfit the second armor with solar cells to absorb solar energy, as well as most other forms of energy like electricity and heat, and could use these forms of energy to power the suit, not unlike how Superman absorbs solar energy to power himself. But his most notable weapons were his rivet cannons that fired molten hot construction grade rivets and his kinetic hammer, a large sledgehammer made of steel and is strong enough to break all but the most indestructible materials. The hammer was voice controlled and able to stop its flight mid path on a dime and even return to John's hands on command. It was also possible for it to change directions mid trajectory if John desired. It having its own electromagnetic field, the hammer could be rendered impossible to move if John wished for it, making it very similar to Thor's mighty hammer. And when John needed to, he could attach the hammer to his armor if he didn't wish to hold it thanks to both his suit and the hammer's electromagnetic properties. Being a kinetic hammer, it absorbed energy as it moved through the air and unleashed any stored energy upon impact with its target. The hammer even seemed capable of disrupting kinetic fields as well as unleashing electromagnetic pulses. The third armor that John created was less durable than the previous two, but had far more maneuverability, relying less on armor plating and more on dampening fields to weather any incoming attacks or hazards. It also increased his strength further, making him capable of lifting up to 70 tons. This is still nowhere near Superman though, considering that Superman can lift in excess of 1 billion tons. It also had onboard artificial intelligence that helped manage the suit's functions, interface with other computer systems and technology, could provide firewalls to protect both John and the armor itself from outside influences like hackers or even mind control in the case of John, and could even make many processes and actions of the armor virtually autonomous. Meaning that John could simply wear the armor or not wear the armor and it would still do anything that he needed it to do, even without him commanding it or directly controlling it. During the Convergence story arc, which took place during the New 52, but involved the pre-Flashpoint versions of many of DC Comics characters, the New Earth version of Steel would gain a liquid metal suit after a run-in with Wildstorm's Gen 13 and getting absolutely positively bodied by them, his power armor was destroyed and John was left paralyzed from the neck down. However, thanks to the dome particles that were present during the Convergence story arc, John was fused with them after Alley Cat touched him. This transferred those dome particles to him, granting him an organic steel suit that he could summon at will. 
This version of the suit could conjure any weapons he could imagine and was just as durable as his original suit without sacrificing his mobility. When switching back over to the New 52 continuity after helping Superman defeat Doomsday in the wake of the Doomsday virus, John would switch out his normal steel power armor to a liquid metal suit very similar to what the New Earth version of John Henry Irons had during the Convergence story arc and is capable of protecting him from not just infections and toxicity native to Earth, but can even protect him from alien and supernatural hazards. It's also capable of controlling his bodily functions like breathing and heart rate either increasing them when necessary or halting them altogether. Even his emotions can be dampened or even heightened during the use of his new armor. Due to the armor's more symbiotic liquid metal nature, he can impart the armor to others as needed, and anyone he gives his armor to will have the same exact powers and control as he would. Somewhere along the road, John ended up ditching this suit. Sometime after Action Comics Volume 2 number 48 in 2016, and by the time you get to Superwoman number 1 later on in 2016, he's seemingly gone back to his original steel power armor. That said, neither of these were the first time that steel had an organic steel form. Prior to the New 52, steel possessed something similar thanks to Lex Luthor's tampering with his DNA in what was called the Everyman Project, an experiment to give normal humans metahuman capabilities without their consent. Steel's metahuman powers manifested as an ability to coat himself in organic steel with the added benefit of being capable of heating up that same metal coating and even causing it to turn into molten metal. These powers were only temporary, lasting just long enough for Lex Luthor to gather data on the results and they wore off, returning John Henry Irons back to his normal self. Beyond his armor and other highly advanced weapons, Steel is an incredible fighter, skilled in American boxing and has even picked up some techniques from his time hanging around Superman, Batman, and other heroes of the DC Comics universe. And while I've talked a great deal about his mind already, with his computer science and mechanical engineering background, it would likely not surprise you that he's very capable in the arena of manipulating computer hardware and software. He was even able to help Superman repair the Fortress of Solitude. With how closely Milestone Media worked with DC Comics back during the time of the early 90s, since DC was considered their publisher, it's highly likely Steel was in at least some small way cribbed for Milestone's hardware who hit comic shelves several months before Steel. While they're not exactly the same character, the early days of Steel were not that far apart from what you'd see in a hardware comic. Their armors are wildly different in appearance, but both highly advanced in the same direction. That and Curtis Metcalf being a hard luck kid with a genius intellect growing up to become a high-tech weapons and gadget manufacturer is virtually identical to John Henry Irons' trajectory and made things even more interesting when the two would meet up during the Worlds Collide event. Throughout John Henry Irons' time in DC Comics, he's been a member of both the Supermen of America as well as a card-carrying member of the Superman family. He has also been a member of the Justice League, the Justice League Reserves, the Justice League United, and the Suicide Squad. Now, a lot of the things I've mentioned about Steel, if you've been keeping up with the character for a long time, you probably already know. But one thing I think a lot of people don't know about Steel is that he isn't the first hero in DC Comics to ever go by that name. John Henry Irons isn't even the second person to go by the name of Steel. He's actually the third, following both Hank Haywood Sr. and Hank Haywood III, who both used the moniker of Steel during their time in the Justice League of America. Though many people don't associate the name Steel with them because they tended to be called Commander Steel more often than not. Others have also used the name as well, like Nathaniel Haywood, the grandson of the original Steel, taking up the mantle years later, and John Henry's own niece, Natasha Irons, taking up the mantle when John was trapped by the entropy Igus of Darkseid. That said, despite being the third in a long line of characters by the name Steel, at DC Comics, John Henry Irons is the most popular and well-known among them. Now let's get into some recommended reading. 
I'm gonna recommend you check out The Adventures of Superman number 500 for John Henry Irons' first appearance. I'll also recommend you check out Steel number zero through five to see his earliest outings as a hero post the reign of Superman. I'll also recommend you check out Steel number six through seven and Hardware number 17 and 18 to witness Steel take on his milestone media equivalent, Hardware. Now this one, I'm gonna be jumping all over the place. I'm gonna recommend Superman, Man of Steel number 22 through 28, 95 through 110, 116 through 120, and 123 through 125 to see Steel working alongside Superman more often than not and honestly I feel is where you're gonna get the lion's share of a lot of John Henry Irons appearances in DC Comics. I'll also recommend you check out Action Comics number 689 and 691 to see Steel fight back against Eradicator during the reign of the Superman story arc and work with a recently revived Superman. I also recommend Action Comics number 900 through 904 to see Steel help Superman and the rest of the Superman family take on Doomsday just before the New 52. I'll also recommend Action Comics Volume 2, number 31 through 39, to see the New 52 version of Steel working alongside the New 52 version of Superman to fight back against Doomsday once again and a mysterious virus. I will also recommend Steel Volume 1, number 34 through 52, which is when Christopher Priest took over the book from Louise Simonson, and admittedly, this was probably the blackest DC comic that was ever written at the time. With many of the book's themes heavily focused on many of the social, political, and economic issues that black people dealt with in real life during the late 90s. I will go ahead and give you a fair trigger warning. It is definitely a difficult read, not because it's not good, but because some of it is just really messed up. And then last but not least, I'll also recommend that you check out Superwoman number 1 through 18. If, while this book largely focuses on Superwoman, what many don't realize about the book is since the New 52, John Henry Irons and longtime Superman confidant Lana Lang have been in a relationship with one another, eventually leading up to them getting married. And this series actually focuses a lot on their dynamic, as well as overcoming some heartbreaking realities, while their relationship becomes just as strong as the steel John Henry Irons is known for wearing. John Henry Irons is a character that, while I know a lot of people negatively associate him with that terrible Shaquille O'Neal movie of the same name. I usually don't think about that movie very often at all when I think about this character. I typically tend to think about a lost or missed opportunity. During the reign of the Superman, it was something that I found kind of laughable when Steel was first introduced because they tried to pitch it as, oh, this guy could possibly be Superman having returned from the dead. And it was just so obvious that he wasn't because, well, for one, he was a black man. And while DC and Marvel have had their stints with making problematic jumps like that, I can list off multiple times that both Marvel and DC has turned white characters black. And I don't mean that a white character passed their mantle to another character who happened to be black, but I mean an actual white character who became a black person. This is not the only time these things ever actually happened. But even then, I still thought the idea was ridiculous to even consider. It's like, no, this guy isn't the real Superman. Of course, he's not Kal-El reincarnated as a black man, because that would in fact have been a bridge too far for me. However, I did love the idea of Steel once he kind of started to, I won't necessarily say step out of Superman's shadow, but once the reign of Superman had come to an end, I feel like that was the moment where Steel started to stand on his own. And while you would often see him palling around with Superman to the point that they largely consider themselves best friends, despite not having his own ongoing series, except for once in his publication history, Steel largely largely became his own character and stood alone in his own right. The only thing that's kind of sad about this is that his one ongoing series that he had that ran for, I believe, 50 issues has never been repeated again. And I do feel it's long overdue time that we get him back 
into that upper echelon. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you do the YouTube thing, like, share, don't forget to subscribe, as well as tap that notification bell so you don't miss any videos that I put out. The goal is to hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube in 2023, so let's make it happen. Click that button and become one of Earth's mightiest subscribers. In the meantime, let me know what you think about the character Steel. Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.